Hey, it's Lucy. Okay, this is something I've been meaning to do for ages and that is go through all my most recent videos and answer any questions I find there. If you asked a question, I really hope I cover it. Uh, let's get going. Pre-PhD stuff. Talk about your PhD application process and interview experience. Well, first of all, a please might have been nice. So applying for PhDs in the UK is pretty straightforward. For the UK, I applied to two. They were Oxford and a group of London universities. And I had to send in a CV, a personal statement, and a 500 word essay on something that interested me. As for the interviews, I had two both of my applications in the UK. Oxford's was first, and as such, I was far more nervous. I remember waiting to go in with a head crammed full of advice I'd read on the internet, but the only thing I could remember was, don't call the academics by their first names, use their title. But then when a woman came to get me, the only thing I could remember from the email was her first name. So I'm like, oh, hello, you must be Karen. Ah, I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm not even in the room and I've already screwed it up. Two things to take from this. First, don't let any one thing throw you off kilter and make you think, I've blown it and give up because you never know what your interviewers are thinking and you might be doing just fine. And secondly, don't just take advice off the internet as word of God because looking back, I'm not like 100% sure I would agree with that advice. I mean, you want to be professional and you definitely don't want to be over personal, but I know some academics who couldn't care less and so I don't really have a strong opinion. Hi Lucy, thanks for the video. I have some questions. How have you prepared for your PhD before you were accepted into the program? What kind of preparation was it? So how did I prepare before I was accepted? Um, I read as many papers as I could. I wanted to figure out what the most pressing issues were in my area of research and where I could come in. I wanted to see could I think of any ways to address those problems and which bits most interested me. At this stage, you're not expected to know the answers or to be able to formulate your own PhD project but it does make you look far more serious when approaching potential supervisors and in an interview. And it also sharpens your own reasons for why exactly you want to continue. As I said in my video about what I did in the year between my PhD and my master's, I also wrote up my master's research as a paper. So this forced me to understand my research as well as I possibly could, and it also brought me exactly up to date with all the literature in that field. It also got me back into the academic frame of mind, like thinking, how can I frame my arguments? How can I defend myself? Where would I improve if I did it again? And that was just a really good exercise. To be honest though, preparing for the PhD is also about enjoying the freedom while you can. I lived with my boyfriend for the last few months before I started, and we used to go hiking, we used to cook, and these are things that we don't really get to do much anymore, so enjoy the freedom while you can, because you're gonna want those memories when you're starting. Coding. How did you get over the first six months of advanced maths and coding? Did you do maths or coding in your undergraduate or masters? So when I first began my PhD, we had six months of coding and maths in theory to prepare us for the PhD. I tried coding in my undergraduate several times and hated it, and so I was I was really hoping that this would be a way for me to improve. I got through that experience without really taking anything from it and just avoided coding like the plague until about six months ago when my supervisor was like, oh hey, you should really code this thermodynamics graph to really get your head around it. So I got myself out a book from the library. It was called Getting Started with MATLAB by Ruta Pratep. I'll put the name in the box thing. And I just took it one step at a time. I actually got my head around it when I started making the graph I was after, not just doing the exercises in the book, because I actually had to do it. So whenever I got stuck on something like, okay, well, how do I make this line gray? I would just Google it. And I quickly learned that that was how you coded. You just Google it. Practice Googling and a reference book. And now I can code, which is completely mental. Time management. How did you manage your time as a PhD student? How many hours per day do you need to study? Did you have enough time for decent sleep, working out, general self-care, or do some of those things go by the wayside? <gasps> did you have time for seeing friends and family? Oh my gosh, that's a lot of questions. Let's start with how I manage my time. I slowly figured out that I'm a morning person and that I'm most productive when I first get up and that by the end of the day in the evening, I'm just exhausted. So I shifted my day around to suit that. Really though, it varies so much that there's no one typical day and there's not really any set hours that I work. Sometimes it's 10 hours because I'm on a roll and don't really notice the time. Or sometimes it gets to two o'clock and I'm like, nah, I'm not feeling it. And I go for a run and then I'll just make up that time another time. Something I will say is that you have to make time for all those important things that you said in your question, like getting enough sleep and seeing family and enjoying hobbies. You won't just have that time lying around in a PhD. You have to actively carve it out. It does get harder the more you get into your PhD to take care of yourself and no one else is gonna take care of yourself for you. So be responsible and look after yourself and treat yourself with kindness. 
Money. Do you do part-time jobs aside from doing your PhD? Man, it's tempting because we're so vastly underpaid, but I really wouldn't recommend it. Anytime you're not working on your PhD, you should either be looking after yourself, like exercising and seeing friends and sleeping well, or you should be doing something that gives you satisfaction, like cultivating a side project or working on something that is really fulfilling. I have written a novel during my PhD, which can and hopefully will be monetized, but that's secondary to why I wrote it in the first place, which is because I just love to write. So. I wouldn't be thinking about the money. The time for earning money will come after, and you will do better in the long term if you focus on your PhD and get a really good PhD so you can get a really good job. So just don't think about money right now. Would love you to do a video on what to buy before starting a PhD. Do you use any diaries or planners that you couldn't be without, hard drives, etc. Hard drives! And another, and another, and maybe another. Back up the backups of your backups, and then back them up again. I am actually backing up my hard drive as I'm filming this video. So yes, a hard drive or two or three, a cloud subscription, a Dropbox subscription, because it's so cheap these days and there is no excuse for losing your data and you will accumulate so much data during your PhD and precious, precious data. So you can't lose it. Otherwise though, I'm not really sure. I'm paperless and use a software called Evernote to store all my notes, which is free and endlessly useful. And I talk about it more in my essential apps video, which again, we'll put in the box thing. Really, you want to spend as little money as possible during your PhD because minimizing your outgoings is the only way to give yourself a pay rise in this situation. So rather than thinking about what you can buy during your PhD, I'm gonna turn this question around and say, what can you not buy during your PhD? Reading. Please tell us your method for reading and and taking notes on scientific papers. Hey Lucy, how many academic papers do you read in a week or a month? Can you make a video about how to read papers and what you are looking for in any specific paper? Okay, I'll show you my Evernote template for when I'm taking notes. This is Evernote. It is a free note-taking app that I absolutely swear by. And what I'll do is I'll open up the paper I'm reading and copy this template to make a new note. I'll keep them open side by side, write down the title, the author, the year, so I can find it again, and then I'll try and fill in these categories as I go. Usually I'll just copy and paste, and I'll make individual bullets for the sections I copy. But for the premise one, I'll write my own summary. This way I can find my notes later by word search, and by copying anything I think is useful, I probably won't have to scroll through that massive paper again. I also take screenshots of any figures if I think they're important. So far, this has really worked for me. I find if I get lazy and just start like copying things in in a long list without using that template, I'll just be copying things in willy-nilly without really thinking about it and thinking about whether it's important. So having that template forces me to like concentrate and assess on what I'm actually looking for. And that's my method. As for how many papers I read, that really varies. Right now I'm writing up results, so reading the literature isn't really a priority, and so it tends to be like an as and when needed situation for me. If I'm writing a paper introduction, then I'll go to town and I might spend a week just searching for and reading papers, and if I find one that's particularly useful, it could be an entire day just reading that one paper. I do try to keep abreast with new papers as they're coming out in case they're important, and a good way to do this is to sign up for email alerts from the key journals in your area. The long and short of it is going about it quantitatively by thinking, you know, have I met my paper quota for the day, is probably less helpful than actually just sitting down and really focusing on the one thing that you are reading and doing that well and understanding it. Hey, can you give any tips on literature review? Mm. I haven't really started my literature review yet. I'm planning on waiting till the very end, that way I know exactly what I need to write about to contextualize my research. But I have written lit review style introductions for papers and reports I've had to write. And when I do that, I tend to make bullet points of headings and subheadings that I expect to go through. That way I can follow my train of thought and see if it's going to be logical for the reader. A good rule of thumb is to start broad and slowly narrow it down until you're completely focused on exactly where your research comes in. I was wondering, have you ever made a video on tips for how to read papers fast or faster? Really, this is something you'll figure out for yourself. As you're reading a paper, you'll start to get a feel for which parts you can skip. Say, if you're just after what they found out, then do you really need to read the methods? But if you're designing your own method, then you'll want to read theirs, as well as read their results, because both might be important. Reading the abstract is the best way to know if a paper is going to be helpful or not, so take real care with that. If it looks like this is exactly what you're after, then you'll want to read the whole paper extremely carefully. If the abstract sounds relevant, then I'll check out the introduction. So this is a great way to find the next paper you're going to read, because they'll be talking about similar things. And then if the introduction seems good, 
I'll skip to the conclusions. Remember my template from before? You don't have to fill this in in the right order, or even fill the whole thing in at all. If I get all I need from the conclusions, and sometimes just a, oh, we found this mineral in this place is all I need, then I can move on to the next paper. But maybe something in the conclusions will make you go, aha, this is interesting. And then you might want to look at the results and the discussion. Reading papers fast and effectively is a skill that you will streamline just by the act of necessity. So just keep reading because that is how you'll get better at it. Writing. Can you do a video on how to make a plan to write your thesis and stick to it? So I can't really make a video on how to do a thesis plan because right now my thesis plan looks like this. It's absurdly, laughably basic, I know, but to be honest, I'm getting by just fine with it. I'm surprised because I'm a big advocate of planning, but I found it just makes sense to kind of keep track of how it looks in my head as I'm going along, kind of as a rolling document. I'm thinking making a massive thesis plan would probably be more time than it's worth. It would change a lot because of the evolving nature of our research. You know, if some things turn out to be super important and you'll want to write about them more, other things just don't work and you kind of want to brush them under the rug. So I feel like making a detailed plan is going to be chopping and changing so much, it's probably just detracting from the actual sitting down and writing time. To quote one of my favourite fictional characters of all time, preparation can only take you so far. After that, you have to take a leap of faith. I started writing about six months ago. It was very low-key, it was very unselfconscious, and I didn't really think about what I was doing because it would have felt too scary to sit down and contemplate writing my thesis. And I've kind of just kept going, and it's been working for me. I do read over my little plan every now and then and update it to how it appears in my head, and I find that minimal level of organisation is just doing the trick. Not sure if it's good advice or not, but it's just a case study of how a person is getting by, so... Hello Lucy, can you share some tips or advice for those people who have a struggle in writing? I'm one of those people struggling in writing and sometimes lose my motivation. Uh, I know what you mean. I love writing. I write fiction, I write non-fiction for entertainment, I've written scientific papers, and now that I'm writing my thesis, I can say the thesis is the hardest because it's just so boring. You're being as descriptive and comprehensive as you can possibly be, as detailed as you can possibly be, and it gets repetitive really quickly. But there are two things that are keeping me going. The first, every single word that you write on that page is a grain of sand filling up a glass, and when that glass is full, you get a PhD-ish. It's an imperfect metaphor. What I mean is, every word counts, it all adds up, and once you've done that, Editing that first draft is easier than the actual writing. And the second thing that keeps me going, which I said in my motivation video, is just... It's gotta be done, so why not just get on with it? You can put it off, but by that deadline, it's gonna be done either way. So just cut out the procrastination, cut out the worrying, cut out the stress, and just do it. Okay, last one. Personal. What are you going to do after your PhD? Ah, that question every final year PhD student dreads. Well, I've been thinking about this long and hard, and I've got a couple of ideas. I'm going to play this one close to my chest, I think, because it's also up in the air, and I'm probably going to make a video on it at some point. But I'll let you know, and I'm definitely going to keep this channel going, so you'll get to see it. Well, all right, that about finishes my Q&A, my first ever Q&A. I really hope you enjoyed this and found it helpful, and I really hope if you asked a question that you got it answered. If you think I should do this again, then please let me know in the comments. This is also a good time to say, if you have any questions you'd like answered, please comment. I'll keep screenshotting the best, and if I get enough, I would love to do this again. Thank you so much for listening. My name is Lucy Kizik. I'm a final year PhD student at the University of Oxford, and take care.